I get the last word on George because the other night uh, I played Judge Walker and George played the uh, lawyer for the bad guys in eight, and I got the last word on George. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to read from Huck Finn. Um, first, something that uh, Mark Twain put at the front of his book. In this book, a number of dialects are used to wit the Missouri Negro dialect, the extremist form of the backwoods southwestern dialect, the ordinary Pike County dialect, and four modified varieties of the last. The shadings have not been done in a haphazard fashion or by guesswork, but painstakingly, and with the trustworthy guidance and support of personal familiarity with these several forms of speech. Well, this is the fourth uh, most banned book in American history. Uh, one month after publication in 1885, the Concord uh, Massachusetts Public Library banned it as trash and only suitable for slums. In 1902, the Brooklyn Public Library banned it because of the language again. Huck not only itched, but he scratched. He said sweat when he should have said perspiration. <laughs> and uh, just last year, a professor at Auburn University published a version of this book where the word nigger is changed to slave over 200 times, totally changing the character of the book. Um, what is lost by banning Huck Finn or changing its language? Well, Jim, nigger Jim, is the noblest character in the book. In many ways, it's moral hero. To lose the book is to lose the nobility of his friendship with Huck and his actions especially at the end when he risks his freedom to help the wounded Tom Sawyer, whose moral turpitude lay in concealing the fact that Jim was already set free by Miss Watson's will, then forcing him to undergo the trials of Tom's romantic version of escape. Jim and Huck's friendship, once it is fully established in the passage I'm going to read, would be lost, especially a friendship between a white Southern boy and an African-American slave in 1880. Other things of Mark Twain's clear sighted vision of this America in, uh, in the eight years it took him to write this book. The Granger for Jefferson feud, Colonel Sherburne's cold blooded shooting of old Fox, and the cowardice of the mob when it confronts Sherburne, the scurrilousness of the king and the duke, uh, the brutality of Prop Finn, the uncomfortable piety of especially Miss Watson, who was willing to sell Jim down the river and separate his family while she <clears throat> teaches up the Bible. The moral degradation of slavery and Southern attitudes. When Huck tells, in, in the person of so-called Tom Sawyer, tells Mrs. Phelps there was an explosion on board the river boat as he lies that brought him down river. Huck says, we blowed out a cylinder head. She asks, good gracious, anybody hurt? Huck answers, no, we killed a nigger. She replies, well, it's lu lucky because sometimes people do get hurt. Um, this is just part of the book. Uh, Huck has, undergoes a moral education in the story. Uh, when he's on the raft with Jim, uh, it's a kind of idyllic, uh, perfect uh, world. Every time they go on, on uh, land, there's some kind of a terrible thing happens. Uh, but before Huck really learns how to love Jim, Huck plays a big trick on him. They're going down the river. They're both uh, escaping, uh, Huck from his father, Jim from uh, Miss Watson. And they're looking for where the Ohio River comes in to the Mississippi so they can, and they can tell because the Ohio is clear and the Mississippi is muddy. And they want to go up river on a steamboat because it's free. I mean, that's the free state of Ohio, and Jim would then be free. Um, Huck already has problems of stealing a slave. There's more to this. Um, they get separated in the fog. And they miss the river. And uh, the raft gets cover covered with trash. Huck is off somewhere in the canoe. Jim is on, on the uh, raft. They're hooping back and forth to each other, trying to find each other, and they don't. Finally, Jim goes to sleep. Huck finally finds the raft. And this is what happens. When I got to it, Jim was sitting there with his head down between his knees, asleep with his right arm hanging over the steering wheel. The other oar was smashed off and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt. So she'd had a rough time. 
I made fast and laid down under Jim's nose on the raft and began to gap and stretch my fists out against Jim and says, Hello, Jim. Have I been asleep? Why didn't you stir me up? Goodness gracious, is that you, Huck? And you ain't dead? You ain't drowned? You back again? It's too good for true, honey. It's too good for true. Let me look at you, child. Let me feel at you. No, you ain't dead. You's back again, alive and sound, just the same old Huck, the same old Huck. Thanks to goodness. What's the matter with you, Jim? You been drinking? Drinking? Has I been drinking? Has I had a chance to be drinking? Well then, what makes you talk so wild? How does I talk wild? How? Why ain't you been talking about my coming back and all that stuff as if I'd been going away? Huck, Huck Finn, you look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Ain't you been going away? Going away? Why, what in the nation do you mean? I ain't been going anywhere. So where would I go to? And I'll just skip a little. Uh, you ain't seen no toe head looky here? Didn't the line pull loose and the raft go humming down the river and leave you in the canoe behind in the fog? Huck says, what fog? Why, deep fog. The fog has been around all night. And didn't you whoop and didn't I whoop till we got mixed up in the islands and one of us got lost and the other one was just as good as lost because he didn't know where he was? And didn't I bust up again in a lot of them islands and have a terrible time and most get drowned? Now, ain't that so, boss? Ain't it? You answer me that. Well, Huck says, this is too many for me, Jim. I ain't seen no fog, nor no islands, nor no troubles, nor nothing. I've been sitting here talking with you all night till you went to sleep about ten minutes ago, and I reckon I'd done the same. You couldn't have got drunk in that time, so of course you've been dreaming. So Jim then tells Huck uh, his part of the adventures, and uh, uh, Jim looks around him on the raft, and he sees all the stuff trash, the truck, he calls it, that's on the rail. And he starts to wonder what it's doing there. Um, oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim, I says. But what does these things stand for? It was the leaves and rubbish on the rail and the smashed door. You could see them first rate now. Jim looked at the trash and then looked at me and back to the trash again. He'd got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into the its place again, right away. But when he did get the thing straightened around, he looked at me steady, without ever smiling, and says, what do they stand for? I was going to tell you. When I got all wore out with work and would be calling for you and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost, and I didn't care no more what become of me or the rat. And when I wake up and find you back again, all safe and sound, the tears come and I could have got down on my knees and kissed your foot, I said, thank you. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck, Dad, is trash. And trash is what people is that puts dirt on the head of their friends and makes them ashamed. And he got up slow and walked to the wigwam and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean I could almost kiss his foot get him to take it back. It was 15 minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger. But I'd done it, and I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards, neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't have done that one if I'd known it would make him 